gospel celebrates the fact that we are God's eternal idea. We are your love dream. So I thank you for the witness of our spirits, Father, that cries, Abba, Father, tonight, that echoes within us, that we come from above, that we worship the God of creation, that we are not here by chance, that in Christ Jesus God revealed that He did not make an accident when He made us, that we are engineered by Your design, that we are Your thoughts expressed in ordinary human life, and it makes ordinary human life so extraordinary. Father, we rejoice this evening to gather together in this context. We thank you for every precious friend that traveled so many miles and journeyed through so many difficulties to be here. We thank you for the team that organized so much in the logistics to get people here. Father, I thank you that you refresh us in your presence, that we know the times are refreshing are ours in the presence of God. We suddenly we find ourselves ignited within. And like eagle's wings, we, we feel ourselves drawn into another dimension. Where we forget about our weariness, our tiredness, our feelings of exhaustion, whatever it might be that could possibly distract from this moment. So we sanctify this moment to you. We sanctify our worship to you. Your spirit cries within us, Abba Father, Abba Father. We thank you for an eternal witness, one that does not fade in time. That we're not here trying to delve into ancient historic records when we study scripture. But we have the living testimony of the risen Christ, who bears witness with our spirit of Christ not in history or hiding somewhere in the future, but Christ in us, the hope of glory. We thank you that we can together celebrate him and that our faith is ignited every acknowledgement of Him. And we acknowledge His presence. We acknowledge His completeness. We acknowledge the success of the cross. That He as Lamb of God dealt with every possible definition of sin. That He took away the sins of this world. We're no longer dealing with a guilty world. We're dealing with a forgiven world. An innocent world. And we celebrate our innocence tonight, Father. We thank You, Father. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your Sabbath rest. That you've brought us into a place of total rest. We were so aware of your embrace, and your goodness, your loving kindness. And indeed, what David sang is so true in our own hearts. Thy loving kindness is better than life. Life has nothing to offer us that can compete with the loving kindness of God. Because when His goodness and His loving kindness appeared, He saved us. We thank You, Father. We are not ignorant tonight of every good thing that is in us in Christ. We celebrate Him. Amen. Amen. Ek gaat net die preeksoek hier moet neersoek, is nou nie een covering vorm nie. Kan dat deel met die uitsoek van die mense? Deel net die uit daar, Davi. Hallo my obrie, wat het daar, ek so blim moet te sien. Wat een mooie. Zambia, Lusaka. Dit het nie een lap nie, want ons kan oor al net te willen van die TV nie man, want ons die ding het kan het mooi lyk. I want some hype because I need to put my voice recorder here. So we've got a little pulpit here, we're going to decorate it in a moment. Oh, and we've got light on the subject. I just want to really thank every one of you for making the effort to come to this place. All roads lead to Hermanus, we have found. Quite a few of you that we've had supper with earlier on. Um, I recognized your faces and your names from March this year. I think some of you have even been here March last year. Have we got a couple of hands? This is not the altar call. <laughs> right. Ach, is alright, so ready. I like klaar mooi. Okay. 
commercial market are very weak. Also, we are importing a pulpit from one of the local churches tomorrow. You will see a very nice pulpit here tomorrow. But pulpits are very much there for practical reasons. Oops, I'm messing around with the recording. Um, we are so blessed to have each one of you here. You know, in the context of the gospel that we preach, we have come to appreciate the value of the individual. We have come to appreciate that none of us are just numbers on, on some statistic where we kind of just dwindle into the crowd. But the eye of God is set upon the individual. We have discovered that faith is not our ability to try and concentrate on God for five minutes or an hour in church. But faith is a discovery that awakens in us an understanding that the God of creation is mindful of us. He has known you before time was. You are not introduced to your maker through your brief history on planet earth. Jeremiah 1.5 says, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. And in Psalm 139 we see that God didn't just kind of put you together as a little blob. But he knitted you together in your mother's womb. He is the master supreme architect of your design. He is the engineer. The faith of God engineered you. And he engineered your salvation. The very same God who engineered your design engineered your salvation. So there can be nothing in salvation that could flaw the character of God. Otherwise we are not busy with the gospel. We are busy with some fabrication of man's creative thinking which becomes very distorted in doctrine. But I thank God that we are tapping into a resource that cannot be exhausted. And that resource is the eternal logic of God. When John writes to us in John chapter 1 verse 1, you know, so often we read that chapter and we are familiar with the wording. And we get a few goosebumps when we say, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. But in context, I want you to understand that this man writing there, was an aged man. He was already in his 90s. He has not physically seen Jesus of Nazareth for 60 years. This was now 60 years after the ascension. John knew Jesus briefly for three years, but intimately for another 60 years. Because the introduction, the brief introduction of the life of Jesus Christ that was revealed in his death and in his resurrection and not in his wonderful parables and miracles. Thank God for the intro, for the introduction. But the ultimate voice of God found definition in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul's ministry is a focus on those two realities, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Paul doesn't bother himself to try and get some... Uh, uh, first-hand information from the living disciples who walked with Jesus for three years. Paul says, immediately, I distanced myself from them who knew Jesus after the flesh. Because Paul understood by revelation that the message of Jesus Christ was much more than a wonderful historic moment that started off the Christian calendar. He knew that it was the greatest revelation that could ever impact the human race. It was the revelation of God's eternal thought. God's eternal original logic. What God had in mind when he said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. God had nothing less than you in mind. He had you in mind when he spoke Genesis 1.26. The greatest artist on this planet cannot draw a picture of your face if he's never seen you before. So when God reveals His image and His likeness, what is His reference? But Himself. God had to look at Himself to reveal you. So the celebration of this gospel is what John says in the beginning was the word. We have a Genesis that is larger than time. Larger than the pages of our book that we study. It is the thought of God, the authentic, original imagination of God. And God saw in his imagination the individual. And that same God who engineered the individual engineered our salvation. If we can trust him with tomorrow morning's sunrise, I guarantee that you can trust him with your salvation. There is no crisis that you can experience in your life that will get God off guard. God has provided in Christ everything that it takes 
to live life to the full. Regardless of the size of the storm, the interval of the, the contradiction, regardless of any contradiction, God has succeeded in Christ to redeem. And the measure of God's redemption can only be discovered in His embrace. God did not redeem or heal the sick people so they can continue in His wrong ways. God redeemed what He had in mind originally. What's an eternal romance. So if our doctrine does not underline, does not focus and emphasize this romance that God invites the human race to, then we've got it wrong. We thought we had to invite Jesus, meantime He's inviting us. We thought we've got to invite the Holy Spirit, meantime His name Parakletos is a divine invitation. So He invites us. God has taken the initiative in the reality of the Gospel. He loved us first. And He did not love us as a reward for good behavior. That's called religion. He loved us while we were sinners. There was nothing in your life that could distract from the love of God. The prodigal son could not become prodigal enough to distract from the heart of his father. So we're dealing with a God who always loved us. And He's just called us to come and rest in His embrace. And in that place, He gives definition to our lives. He gives inspiration. I'm very blessed with artistic, an artistic wife and artistic children. And I found that, you know, an artist um, performs at his best when his inspiration is most prominent. An artist cannot perform by command. Birds do not fly by command. They fly by design. And so we've made a very poor substitute in our religious efforts to somehow try and substitute what God originally had in mind for us to be the most natural life. Says the thief comes to steal, to kill and to destroy. And we've made that our focus. We've been so distracted by what the thief is able to do. But there's a huge but. I wish the Greek could have put it in capital letters when John wrote that. John 10 verse 10. But! I have come! Don't ignore me, says Jesus. I have come! We've made so much of what the, steel, what the thief stole from us and how he did us in and how this happened and this shouldn't have happened in my life and oh, we can get so messed up by considering our past. We can get so entangled. Stuff that went wrong, wrong decisions. We start blaming parents and even grandparents. I mean, here's a child born blind. And I think, why is he blind? Must be some hidden curse that's still hanging over his family. We've been distracted. But God's not distracted. Because God has given definition, clear definition to our lives. He has always known us. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 13 says, or 13 verse 12 says, Then we will know, even as we have always been known. And so our point of departure is just one, of knowing that God has always known me. I'm not a surprise to Him. God has always known me. And He's always only loved me. And Jesus has come to convince man of that. Jesus has come to convince the sick, rotten world, a world corrupted to the core, of how much their Maker loves them. And if my gospel does not highlight this, I'm busy with the wrong gospel. It might sound very um, articulate, but it carries no power. The power of God is communicated in the revelation of the love of God. Not even faith can exclude love, because faith works by love. Faith finds its fuel in the love of God. When Paul finds his ministry taking him beyond the point of exhaustion, he says in 2 Corinthians 5.14, The love of Christ constrains me. He's not constrained by some religious discipline. You know, some little uh, program that his church denomination worked out for him. He says, by, you know, here's your goals for this month. Try and reach so many souls for Jesus. Paul's not constrained by that stuff. He knew that stuff under the law. He says, it's beyond all comparison to what the law could get out of me. What love now drives me to. He says, because I've made this calculation. One has died for all. Therefore, all have died. So we have 
a common point of departure the death of Jesus Christ the death of Jesus Christ is our death he did not die his own death he died humanity's death and if that is our reference then from now on Paul says we can no longer know any man after the flesh we have no other knowledge of man we are wasting our time to gather any other information outside of the revelation of what happened to mankind when Jesus died so in the death of Jesus Christ God succeeded to represent God's faith represented the human race before anyone but God believed in salvation see God did not try out a new product on the market you know sometimes when they say you want to start your own business you're going to have to do some market research because you might have this fancy idea but if nobody wants to buy your idea you're wasting your time and your money to put this thing together so you do a bit of market research to check if there's a spot in the market for me a little presence in the market God did not send Jesus to try out the religious market see if there's a if there's a, if there's scope you know in, in this whole conglomeration called religion for Christianity God did not have Christianity in mind he had only one thing in mind his passion and his passion was you his passion was the individual for the individual to realize again the integrity of my design God did not make a mistake when he made you yes many mistakes must have happened since then but God had something bigger than the sum total of your mistakes the sum total of humanity's mistakes was exceeded by a greater plan called the plan of salvation so we're not looking at the Mickey Mouse salvation here tonight and in the 10 days of our celebrating him we're not going to tamper with the word of God we're not going to allow the word of God to be watered down to human experience we're going to allow the spirit of truth to counsel us in all truth and we're going to allow the spirit of truth to counsel us in such a way that our own hearts resonate our own hearts resonate beyond personal ideas we might have many ideas here tonight we somehow accumulate stuff I found out as a young man moving into my first little apartment when I started studying in the Pretoria University that when I moved from one apartment to my next apartment I needed more than a wheelbarrow to carry my stuff because we accumulate stuff and you know as you grow you start accumulating more stuff now imagine your mind accumulating stuff in time because information I mean we've never been more bombarded as a humanity than what we are right now bombarded with stuff and we carry stuff that we don't need but I thank God you know you get these antivirus stuff on computer and uh, a brother was there the other day cleaning my computer's head I thought what a wonderful thing that we can do in computer language that we can clean this stuff because you know when you when you start working on a computer and it starts getting slow and you know <laughs> Yeah, you can't get, it doesn't want to open up you want to hit the thing and try and, because there's too much stuff on it and I just thank God for the word of God that is living and active cutting like a soldier's sword like a doctor sharper than a doctor's scalpel to the division of soul and spirit because your soul can gather so much stuff God wants to free your spirit to be in dominion again so that your soul is not your boss but it's a wonderful servant of the spirit man the reality of your true life redeemed uncluttered thoughts uncluttered thinking I woke up the other night in Budapest um, in Hungary about two o'clock that night and God spoke to me he said to me there's nothing wrong with this world and I woke up I thought God that can't be you have you read the newspaper, I, mean, I can't read the stuff in, in Hungary, but did you read the South African newspaper lately? You know what I mean? God says there's nothing wrong with this world. I woke up two o'clock, I sat up in my bed and I thought, no, I need to write something down. I think God's going to say something to me. I said, there is nothing wrong with this world. And I thought, what's God talking about? And then I heard the next sentence, because there's nothing wrong with redemption. There's only something horribly wrong with man's thinking. We're thinking wrong. And so the whole presentation of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, is to confront the human race 
with the original thinking of God. Because in the beginning was the Logos. In the beginning was the thoughts of God. God considered you. He imagined you. You see, religion wants to try and imagine God. So we try and create gods of our of sorts. Doctrines, ideas, philosophies. Peter says we were not following cleverly devised myths when we declared to you the glory of God. We were eyewitnesses of His majesty. We cannot capture the majesty of God in inferior doctrinal definitions. God revealed Himself in His eternal thought. And He freed the human race to discover again the original thought pattern of God. What God had in mind when He made man. Nothing less than His image and His likeness. A display. But not as in a display window. As in a mirror. As in a mirror. Okay. Here ook is a voice on his beak. He still marked for no. I don't think there is any other. I know there is no other emphasis in scripture. That carries more dynamic, radical uh, impact on the human mind than making the simple discovery that when I deal with scripture, I'm not dealing with a recipe book on how to behave. I'm not dealing with some kind of moral system that encourages good moral behavior. That's called window shopping. I'm discovering with unveiled face the mirror image of the blueprint of my design. The original thought of God unveiled. Unveiled. The mystery that was hidden for ages and generations is now revealed again. It's Christ in you. Not Christ hiding in history or in future or somewhere in outer space. The Hubble telescope can go millions times millions of light years into outer space and they won't discover him because they're looking in the wrong direction he's not hiding in the book or in a building or in space or in time he's revealed in you his desire is to communicate the integrity of your authentic life our lives have become so boxed in in cultural definitions ethnic definitions our wars especially in Africa our wars are inspired by all these things stuff that matters not in the light of this gospel because one has died for all meaning he died humanity's death he died Adam's death and as much as we were in Adam because of that association much more Paul says we are in Christ you know that we are in Christ before we were in Adam that's why John says it's not a new gospel 1 John chapter 2 verse 7 uh, sometimes we read that and we think oh, no, that stuff is very new it might be new because we've, we've not been preaching this for a long time on planet earth but it's not new to God because in the beginning was the word the same logos, the same logic continues to speak and God addresses humanity in Christ, not in Adam we have reduced our concept of man to Adam but God says I've known you before I formed Adam So the revelation, the key revelation of scripture is the revelation that we are in Christ by God's design. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30 says, of God, of God's doing, are you in Christ? And that association gives integrity to our gospel. That gives an audience to this gospel. We can address people of any creed, culture, any kind of geographical context, faiths into insignificance when we discover one another in Christ he has come to give definition to our lives in him we discover that our lives are not here by chance but there's destiny there's significance to the individual's life as God has defined it in Christ Jesus so if there's nothing wrong with this world and there's something seriously wrong with man's thinking then I believe that our ministry 
has to find its ingredient in the thoughts of God. I was chatting to someone on Facebook last week. Mia, do you know Mia from Holland? The Facebook people? She shared something beautiful about how she responded to one of our daily thoughts. And we, I think it was on the Afrikaans um, um, daily thought. We spoke about that kavar moment where our thoughts and the thoughts of God intertwine. Ons gedagtes dier vleg met Godse gedagtes. And she translated that into Dutch. And she wrote something beautiful about this freedom that God has revealed in her to, to participate in His thoughts and realize that we, we share His thoughts. And then someone kind of attacked her and said, how dare you say that? You know, you're a, and this person was a doctor in some kind of science and says, how dare you? You know, I mean, you're a sinful, unholy being. And how can you reduce God to your level? You know, you can't share God's thoughts. He has his own thoughts. And then this woman made the mistake to quote Isaiah 55. This woman who attacked I, um, our sister. And she quoted the favorite scripture that you'll hear preached at many funerals. It says in verse 8, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. And then verse 9 she quoted, this is the one she quoted, For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh -huh. So I wrote in heaven's sake, for heaven's sake, read the next verse. How dare we stop short at reading the good news. That's bad news. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's thoughts higher than our thoughts. So you think that's it, we stuck down here. To our own devices, to our own schemes, our own cleverness, our own experiences. And we're caught up in this whirlpool of our circumstances. And circumstances play yo-yo with us. And we're going to the snakes and ladders mode, you know. Today I've got this ladder and I feel so thrilled and something good has happened to me. And then tomorrow the snake swallows me again. It's the fall of the dice that dictates. But thank God for the next verse. Verse 10. Read on. Verse 10 says, but... As, just as, just like, here's the parallel. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven. Remember God's thoughts are now hiding somewhere in heaven. In our experience it feels like God's so far removed from me. It's as far as the heaven is removed from the earth. God says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven. Why? To cancel distance. To remove the obstacle. So that that which was far can come near. So we sing little songs that says, From a distance, God is watching us. Boring. God's not watching you from a distance. That's the religious eloquence. And it's distorted message. The rain and the snow cancelled the distance between heaven and earth. God says, just like that, just like that. So shall my word be. And what did the rain do? And the snow, what did it do? It awakened the seed in the soil. It saturated the soil. Your thoughts, your mind saturated with the mind of God. So when Jesus came to planet earth, He came to saturate human history with the impact of God's eternal thought. He did not come to start the Christian religion. Not by any definition. He came to reveal the original, the image, and the likeness of God. Not in some beautiful book, not in some historic formula, but in human life. He came to reveal humanity in one life. If we can have in our sport context, one person representing our country in football, in rugby, in tennis, in cricket, in golf, in whatever discipline we're interested in. How much more that the living God, the creator of the universe represent you you did not choose him he chose you we can choose soccer teams he identified you in Christ and what he revealed in Christ was consistent with his original love dream he says the rain and the snow comes down from heaven waters the earth making it bring forth and sprout Irresistible change. Lydia and I last year camped 
in the Kruger National Park. We're going back there very shortly from now, in about two weeks' time. And for the first three nights, for the first three days that we were there, it rained non-stop. And I took photographs the next week of little green shoots cracking through the soil. A little tender green shoot cracking through the soil. Change was irreversible because of the rain. The rain carries an impact that cannot be hidden. And we took before and after pictures of the same piece of field and those trees blossoming green. Suddenly that winter, the winter cleared, that winter cloak was removed and spring arrived in the rain. A little bit beyond our time, our schedule. Spring is not always on schedule sometimes. But when the rain came, there was a moment. And I want to encourage you that God's rain has come. We are looking in the wrong direction when we pray for revival. Say, oh God, would you not tear open the heavens? And God's sitting here thinking, but what else can I give you? Because every blessing that heaven has, God has communicated in Christ. God has exhausted himself, if he can, the inexhaustible one, by giving Christ. Because in many and various ways, God spoke of old to the prophets, to the fathers, to the prophets. But in these last days, God has spoken to us in a son. Jesus is the culmination of God's thought. Everything God could say to the human race, he said in one person. When he cancelled distance, the eternal logos that was before time was, was made flesh. And unfortunately our translation says in tabernacles amongst us. The Greek says in tabernacles within us. The word took on human form. Because that's the destiny of the word. That's the eternal destiny of the word. It's God's word. God's word becoming you. Isaiah 55, for as the rain and the snow come down from him and return not thither but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, furnishing the seed to the soul and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. Can you see the practical impact of this rain? Not just to beautify the soil, but to give seed and bread, to sustain human life. God has you in mind. I know this whole book is about Jesus. But you know what? The whole of Jesus is about you. God has you in mind. Because in these last days, God has spoken to us. We are God's audience. God's not wasting words. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty. But it shall prosper in my desire. God's desire, God's purpose prospered when Jesus Christ hung on that cross. When that grave could not hold him, God's purpose prospered in the resurrection. Because we were in Christ from before the foundation of the earth. None of the rulers of this world understood this. Otherwise they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. They failed to understand the mystery of God's purpose. And this gospel is the revelation of the mystery of God's purpose. Nothing that happens in our history can hold back, restrain the purpose of God. If the resurrection could not be stopped, then God's purpose from prospering cannot be stopped. So we are going to celebrate God's purpose prospering in human life. Thank you, Father. I'm going to give you an early night tonight, so I'm not going to...